EU is fascinating in the sense that there is n nothing else like it, right? Uh, that, that, that was the, the, the thing when it started, the, the fact that it's multi-dimensional, that uh, the, the now 28, soon 27 after the, the UK leaves, but nevertheless now that you have 28 countries that managed to get together, that created, now are part of the European Union, uh, that uh, it, it plays such an important role uh, and is able to organize uh, social, economic, political life in Europe uh, and, and create stability. Uh, in a way, a lot of people say that the EU has been the most stabilizing force uh, in a continent that was ravaged by two world wars and, and, and other minor wars. And if you look at what's happening in the Balkan, uh, it's the same thing, right? The, there was the Balkan Wars in, in, in the 1990s. Uh, and now as these members become, as these countries become members of the EU, they're, they, 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 they're becoming more stable. It doesn't mean that politics doesn't happen, that you don't have disputes, but at least it provides a mechanism whereby these disputes can be settled in a peaceful way. Uh, and, and, and certainly the EU has had a great role in that. And it's also now with what's happening in, in, in the United States, in, in other parts of the world, in Russia, in China, where these countries are certainly more nationalistic, uh, less embracing of uh, the post-war inst international, or, you know, or liberal international economic order, if you want, and, and global governance. Uh, the EU, as one of the defenders and promoters of uh, this, 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 this this global governance uh, mechanisms uh, as, as, has become you know, even more prominent, even more important. And, and for a country like Canada, this is very important. We believe in multilateralism. And right now, let's say the EU is becoming uh, our, our strongest partner in trying to promote uh, th those mechanisms. Uh, again, to, to, to provide rules of the game and, and then settle disputes in a way that doesn't involve war, whether it's a trade war, whether it's real wars. Uh, so for that, the EU, is, is, to me, it still exercises a, a great fascination. Yeah, they, well, the, the notion that Europe is in crisis has been going on now for over 10 years. And, and yet, the EU is still there, Europe is still there. And in part, I think it's because of the EU and the way that uh, it has created mechanisms. They're not perfect, obviously. They don't resolve all the issues. And sometimes, you know, compromises have to be made. Like, like in, in, in any situation, any polity, whether you look at Canada, whether you look at the United States, uh, you know, Politics is messy, uh, but ultimately the question is, does it work? Does it lead to some kind of agreements that, that try to deal with those crises situation or those problems as they arise? And I think the EU has managed to do this over and over again. If you look at the economic crisis, uh, the fact that it, you know, it has managed the crisis as best as it could, given that there were 28 countries around the table, that many of these countries were actually bankrupt, and that other countries had to bail them out, the EU did manage to to federate and, and create compromises and cooperation and, and even push European integration further than, than most people would have thought possible before the crisis. So in a way, the, the, there was an op the, the crisis created an, op an opportunity and, and, and the EU responded, maybe not right away, maybe not in the way that most people thought was the most effective way of doing this, but nevertheless, ultimately it worked. The euro is still there. Uh, the countries that we thought would leave, like Greece, did not leave uh, as a result of this. They, they, they got the bailouts uh, that they required. Yes, con harsh conditions were, were, were imposed, but this this is how it should be. No one gives money for free. Um, and, and, and it was all done in a peaceful way, uh, even if the rhetoric sometimes was not that peaceful, but nevertheless, it worked. And it's the same with migration. Yes, a deal with Turkey was done, but you know what else could have been done at the time? Still, millions of people came in. Yes, it, it, it might have fueled populism, but populism is, is not just an issue in Europe. It is an issue in the United States. It is an issue in other countries. You know, it's even an issue in, in, in Canada, except that it doesn't have the same press, but it's still, it's not, you know, sometimes we have the tendency to look at the EU as, as kind of those problems are only EU-like problems, but they're not. And, and what we should look at is how does the EU manage to, 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 to deal with these crises, deals with these problems, and ultimately does it find acceptable solutions? And, and overall, it seems that it does, and it seems that the fact that it, it has the, the possibility of bringing these, these countries together, of bringing these people together, of, of, of having, you know, uh, pooling the resources to deal with, that, with those problems, 
I think that's really what's important. Uh, whereas individually, if those things had happened, uh, the countries would not have been able to do this. It would have created even more problems, even more resentment. Uh, so I think in a way, the EU has been much more the solution than the problem itself. Uh, and, and we have to be careful not to confuse the two and say, well, that's an EU problem or the EU is in crisis. No, these are in a way European issues, European problems, European crises, and how does the EU help to, to, to solve these problems. In fact, when the EU doesn't manage to, often it's because the member states don't want the EU to actually find a way. And, and, and I think that's what we're seeing. And that's why it, it is very fascinating to study the politics of the EU. But we should, not, we should not forget that similar problems happen in other countries and their politics uh, also uh, play out. You know, Canadian scholars who study the EU uh, certainly bring their the use perspective into the Canadian public policy debates and vice versa, right? Uh, EU scholars who study Canada or even Canadian scholars study the EU bring also you know, what Canada is doing and the fact that you know, Canada is a federal system and the EU is a federal-like system, uh, there's a lot that, that both sides can learn from each other. Certainly uh, in Canada, the, the EU is probably not as, as, as well understood as it should be, but that's true also of Europeans vis you know, in terms of Canada. There's a great story that when uh, Canada and the EU start negotiating CETA, the Europeans arrive and they thought that there was a single market in, in Canada and then they realized there is no such thing. There is no free trade in Canada and they were very surprised. They said, well, we have it, but you don't. Uh, and, and these are the peculiarities. But at the same time, there is great interest uh, in Canada and among can Canadian public policymakers to understand what is happening in Europe, how is Europe dealing with these things, and vice versa. In terms of immigration, certainly the Europeans have been very interested in the Canadian model. How do we integrate immigrants? It's not perfect, but it certainly seems to be working better than, than, than in Europe. So there's been learning on, on that front, and, 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 and Canadian and uh, EU-based scholars uh, who, who compare the two systems have worked very hard in, in promoting this. And, and I think uh, th there is you know, somewhere the influence percolates. It may not always show up as like, oh, here's what the EU, sh the, the EU lesson for Canada or vice versa, but it informs in, in the back of our minds how we approach uh, certain issues. So certainly CETA uh, is, as, as, has informed my views in terms of Canadian trade policy, and it's raised issues in terms of ca how Canada is, 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 is able to negotiate trade agreements. What are the, the, the consequences as, as, as trade agreements become um, in a way deal more with regulatory issues and, and in the Canadian context often that falls under uh, the provincial competences. Uh, and so how does Canada organize itself and, and should it look to the EU to try to develop some kind of institutional mechanism to, to help with um, the negotiations, right? Where the EU, they might have 10 people showing up in the negotiations. We have more than 100 because we have the provinces and all that. That's not very effective. So there is there an e a lesson for the EU. Now, whether that can be implemented, again, it's a question of politics. But, you know, often the EU will have lessons for Canada institutionally. And the same for CETA in terms of negotiating new agreements and all the committees that have been set up and the governance of it. This is all new. So I, I think, yes, uh, there is certainly influence uh, from the EU and, and, and scholars who study the EU in Canada bring this knowledge to Canadian public policy debates. Mm -hmm.